Hi, I am delighted and honored to introduce Professor Tim Beatley. For at least 25 years, Dr. Beatley has been deeply, he's deeply pondered the role and potential of cities. Cities are a great habitat for human beings. They're full of diversity, ongoing information exchanges, an edge of danger, places to live, work, and play. Humans are truly social beings, but we are also biological creatures born of millions of years of evolutionary history on this planet. We need both the diversity, diversity and density of cities, and we need contact with a life force of which we are a part. As we become more and more urbanized, more industrialized, and as human population has swelled almost beyond Earth's capacity to sustain us, cities have taken on an almost impossibly difficult role as human home. At this point of the climate and biodiversity crises, it is clear that humans need to withdraw from much of the Earth's surface to give space to the others with whom we share this planet, implying even more urbanization. To respond, we must figure out how to make beautiful and just cities and find ways to bring our evolutionary selves into them. This is what Professor Beatley's been studying and practicing and writing about as a Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities in the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning at the University of Virginia School of Architecture. He is one of the strongest and most creative voices we have to help us learn how to make cities places of diverse urban life with ancient connections to the earth, with nature. I'm enamored with his new book, The Bird Friendly City, that uses our avian kin as allies in our work of urban placemaking. Truly birds are the canary in the mine. And if we make cities good for birds, we can make it a better place for all of us. How? That's what the book and this talk is about. Humans are tuned to the sound of birds. Like the spring during the pandemic, when the sound and color of birds filled our lives as a result of the lockdown, like never before. Birds speak to us, they watch us, they reach out to us in color and song. What city wouldn't be richer for sharing it with the birds? So thanks, Tim Beatley, for your work, and thanks for joining us at Birds on the Niagara a love story of our region and the birds with whom we share a home. Thank you. Wow, well, thank, thank you so much, uh, Linda. And I'm gonna go right to sharing the slides. Okay, well, thank you, Linda, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And it's great to be with you at least uh, virtually. So I am in the time that I have going to do a couple of things. Um, as this slide suggests, I'm gonna introduce you to the idea of biophilic cities, um, but also bird friendly cities and, and um, really the connections between uh, these, these two topics. And um, so to start, um, as Linda mentioned, you know, one of our challenges is to begin to reimagine places and reimagine cities. We know that um, cities today face uh, really significant challenges thinking about how they adapt to climate change, um, how we pretty quickly hopefully reduce our, our carbon emissions. Cities play a really important role there. Uh, we want compact and dense cities where we can walk and bicycle and that have a small uh, ecological footprints. Um, but at the same time, we need to have places that are full of nature. We need cities that are profoundly natureful and, and biophilic. Can you have that compactness and density together? Um, and, and we argue, yes, you can. And in fact, you, you must uh, think about cities um, as dense and natureful. So around 2011 or so, we started something called the Biophilic Cities Project here uh, at, at UVA building around this concept of biophilia. Here is one definition on the screen from E.O. Wilson. Have to give a lot of credit to E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson at Harvard. Wasn't the first person to use the word biophilia, but he's really the one who uh, uses it in the way that we think of it. This, uh, this notion that we've co-evolved with, with nature, that we, to be uh, happy and healthy and to, to lead truly meaningful lives, we need to have that nature uh, around us. And it, it can't just be something that you get once or twice a year 
uh, on a holiday, um, a vacation. It has to be designed uh, around us, has to be all around us where we spend most of our time in our, our, our neighborhoods and, and, and in and around where we work. Um, there's a lot of evidence about the power of nature. And uh, for me, it's, it's very intuitive. I think about the things in the world that um, I'm drawn to, the things that give me a joy and delight and that uplift. And they are living things that they are things like uh, flowers and trees and, and butterflies and, and water. We have a lot of evidence about how these biophilic uh, uh, qualities are things that that make us happy and make us feel better. And, and birds are a, a big part uh, of the story. Um, I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit, a little bit later. Um, some of you know about the evidence uh, from Japan around forest bathing, this idea that as you finish a walk, you walk through a forest. At the end of that walk, um, your stress hormone levels go down. That, that walk in, in nature boosts your immune system. There's tremendous power in having uh, nature all around us. Um, we're not quite sure why nature feels so good to us, um, and, but there is a science behind it, and some of it has to do uh, with fractals and uh, this idea of fractal fluency. We've gotten to know Richard Taylor, who runs the uh, chairs the physics department at the University of Oregon, and has done all, a lot of work around uh, the impact the, the, that fractals have. Fractals are these self-repeating shapes and forms in nature, the leaf of a tree, um, that's a small version of the bow, which is a small version of the larger tree. Um, and Taylor argues that we've, co we've evolved a visual system to sort of effortlessly uh, process those images from, from nature. The image on the left um, is meant to remind me about birdsong. I'm gonna talk in a couple of places about the power of birdsong. Um, these are images actually from a really uh, interesting initiative in the UK where they're using birdsong as a way of detecting hearing loss. Um, but it's also the case that um, just about any hearing of, of birds, any um, birdsong that we're hearing, uh, that it does have that effect of, of reducing anxiety, of, of calming us. And, and we have examples now of hospitals that are recording birdsong and playing it back at particularly stressful uh, times as, as children are going into surgery or, or being inoculated. So, so there is a science behind this biophilia. And, and I, as I say, lots of emerging evidence about the power of nature. We could spend the whole time uh, talking about that. It seems like almost every week there is a new study uh, demonstrating the power of, of nature. Um, this is a slide I, I, I tried to sort of um, summarize a lot of the studies and a lot of the research. It's hard to do that, in fact. Um, and, but it's true that all the things on the right are connected with, associated with, with the presence of nature. Um, just mention lower anxiety, lower levels of depression, lower levels of stress, higher levels of happiness, um, physical activity, the greener the place, the more natureful the neighborhood, the more we want to be outside uh, and, and active. Um, evidence that actually crime rates go down in, in places that have more nature. Gun violence is, is lower. Um, evidence actually coming out of experimental psychology that uh, the, in the presence of nature, we are more likely uh, to be generous, more likely to be cooperative, um, more likely to think longer term. So, you could say in a way that nature helps us to be better human beings. If you had to summarize uh, all of these qualities, we're often using the word flourishing. And flourishing to me is a good word because it's uh, more than enjoyment or pleasure. It's uh, also about meaning and, and purpose in life. And it's flourishing of humans, but also ecological flourishing that we're talking about. We want cities and need cities that have lots of nature, and, and it's important to recognize that those are going to be places that are, that are going to be more resilient as well. So this is an image from, from Rotterdam, where they have been uh, using nature to address uh, water, uh, all the water and flooding issues that they uh, have, have been facing. Um, for example, installation of green roofs, subsidizing green roofs, or, or uh, 
on the second image from the left, uh, one of their water squares or water plazas, this idea actually of having a, a new uh, public spaces uh, with lots of green elements um, that are for the most part uh, places to, to uh, enjoy, but um, they are also designed to retain flood water. So multi-purpose. Multi and, and so many of the investments, most of the things that we might do to make a city more biophilic uh, will, also, will also provide lots of ecological services for, for a city. So we've been um, advocating for this new vision of cities and we call them biophilic cities. And a, here are a few, just, just a few slides that describe in a little bit more detail what a biophilic city uh, is. Uh, it is clearly a city with abundant nature and abundant biodiversity, uh, but they are places that work to connect us to that nature, uh, the nature around us. And biophilic cities are cities with lots of uh, biophilic buildings, um, and there's been a huge trend in the direction of biophilic design, and I'll give you some examples uh, later bringing nature inside into the interior spaces of buildings, um, natural ventilation, uh, day daylighting interior spaces. We want lots of biophilic buildings, um, but we, our vision of biophilic cities is, is much beyond that. It's much more holistic and comprehensive. The idea that it's all the spaces uh, beyond the buildings, between the buildings, uh, from room or rooftop to region or bioregion and all of those spaces in between. And, and hopefully what we're creating is a city uh, of immersive nature where it's possible for you, wherever you are, to have the natural environment present and around you. Um, our vision of biophilic cities is again, one of nature, of connecting to nature, but also connecting to each other um, by way of, of nature. It's also a vision that recognizes the important role that cities play in global conservation. Um, we have huge challenges, huge um, concerns about the loss of biodiversity uh, uh, globally, and increasingly we recognize that cities can be, can be places uh, can, uh, that accommodate uh, biodiversity and can be a partial antidote to lost habitat uh, elsewhere. So we, our vision of biophilic cities is one where we're sharing space with many other forms of life. And we can design and plan the city um, so that more species can be, can be accommodated. Coexistence is sometimes a, a word we use um, implied here as an ethical um, requirement or a, a, um, a desire, a need to, to make sure we, we make room for uh, all the other species that we share uh, the world with. So if uh, I had to summarize the vision of what a biophilic city is, and it will be different from city to city, um, it is this immersive nature idea. So one good example is uh, Singapore, a uh, city and city-state, um, been in our uh, global network of biophilic cities for, from the very beginning, actually. For a long time, they called themselves a garden city. More recently, they've changed that motto to a city in a garden, which seems like a small change, but really quite profound. Um, the idea really that in a biophilic city, you don't just have places where there are places in the city where there's nature, we've got to walk to the park or uh, visit the uh, forest uh, um, down the street. We, we actually want to live in the forest. We want to live in the park, in the garden, and so most recently, Singapore has now been talking about themselves as a city in nature, um, or even if you want to be somewhat redundant, we like this biophilic city in nature. And uh, part of, partly this has been uh, driven by uh, going into lockdown and the fact that in, in the city, um, during the couple of months when everyone was inside, um, the uh, National Parks Board, who is you know, primarily responsible for managing the landscape, uh, wasn't able to, to sort of cut the grass and keep the, the landscape um, um, trimmed and maintained in the same way. And so there was the wildness to the city 
that residents uh, enjoyed and, and now want to uh, preserve. And they, they, so what it's set in motion is a sort of a discussion about uh, wildness. And so we see very much um, a biophilic city as a place that encourages a wild, wildness and wild nature. Um, so um, I've said this already, but the vision of uh, a city from room or rooftop out to region or bioregion, uh, we, we also describe this as a whole of city uh, approach. Um, this is Helsinki on the left, um, that the wonderful comprehensive integrated network of green spaces. So you can walk from the center of the city all, all the way out to old growth forests at the, at the edge. Um, so there are so many ways that, uh, and so many things we can do to incorporate nature into the built environment. And it, it, we can think of this uh, also as an indoor outdoor continuum. We spend a lot of time indoors and too much time indoors. So um, Biophilic City is partly about an, being an outdoor city and doing what we can to propel uh, residents outside. But we do recognize the value of bringing nature inside and the need to sort of overcome the indoor outdoor barriers. And this idea of moving again from uh, a, a view, a vision of the city where you have a few discrete places of nature to one that sees the city as, more holistically as, as an ecosystem. And, uh, and we see the connections between those discrete, those discrete points and we see pathways. Um, the lower right is the ravine system in Toronto. Toronto is our newest uh, partner city in the Biophilic Cities uh, network. Um, Pittsburgh is also in the Biophilic Cities network. And this is uh, an image really just to make the point that even in a developed city, um, we can and do have a lot of nature. Partly this is about changing our, our perception or conception of, of a city. We might look at that bridge and not see very much nature, but there could be nesting peregrine falcons. Uh, equally true, the, the river, the water is a, is a source of nature connection. And, and here in this city, um, you see the new South, South Shore Waterfront Park that brings residents down to, to the edge of, of the water. It's also a resilient, floodable park um, when, when the river floods. So, um, so we started this network um, formally in around 2013. And if you go to the webpage, biophiliccities.org, there is much more information about the joining requirements for, for cities um, joining as partner cities. Um, there is uh, an application requirement. Cities have to indicate uh, how, in what ways they are already uh, natureful and biophilic and what their aspirations are for the future. And they also have to choose a certain number of metrics for uh, that they will track and monitor over time to judge um, positive progress. And, and then also a, a city council adopted resolution or proclamation is required indicating the city's intent to join the network and to aspire to becoming biophilic cities, uh, a biophilic city. So those are, these are news stories you get. We have gotten some wonderful press uh, when cities join. This is Mayor Peduto, uh, the current mayor of Pittsburgh receiving the certificate. I often show up um, and there's often a celebratory uh, event. Um, this case, um, wonderful event at, at the Phipps Conservatory uh, in, in Pittsburgh. So um, just quickly, we now have 24 cities that are officially in the network as partner cities. Um, we also have uh, several thousand individuals. You can join the network as an individual, just go, going to the website, signing our pledge. And that would be a great thing to do if, if you wanted to be involved in the network and, and, um, and, and several hundred organizations also part of the network. Um, so we are uh, actively growing the network and hoping to, to, um, for it to be an even more global network, um, and in particular, hoping to have cities in um, uh, Africa, more cities in, um, in India. We have one city now officially in the network, um, Chinese cities and, uh, and Australian cities. We, we're really hoping to, to grow this network uh, um, around the world. Um, 
there are uh, different ways of thinking about you know what a biophilic city is and I won't go through all of this but these are some of the metrics that you can find on the web page um, all to say or a main point I want to make here is that it isn't just the presence or absence of nature it's also how does a city engage with that nature how how much time do residents spend uh, around nature and and, and how um, how much do they care about it are they able to identify common species of, of birds and, and plants and, and trees. And, and what about the commitment on the parts of, of local governments? What, per, what uh, percentage of a local government's budget goes to the caring for and, and uh, restoring of the natural environment? Things like that, that um, recognize that a biophilic city is more than just the presence or absence of nature, which is of course quite, quite important. It's also about equity. And uh, I have a couple of slides just to make this point that it's, we frequently talk about just bi biophilia, the idea uh, we know that um, we we're, we're, uh, have to face um, this longstanding challenge of uh, systemic racism in our country and social inequity uh, going back to redlining maps and, and earlier uh, spatial segregation in, in cities we know that there is an unfair distribution of nature. And in those cities where um, neighborhoods of color, for example, don't have the same canopy cover, don't have the same um, access to parks, and, and by the way, don't uh, get to enjoy um, the sights and sounds of birds to the same degree that uh, uh, other neighborhoods, more affluent white neighborhoods. So, so uh, this is a big part of our vision as well, that we want equitable uh, uh, nature. These are images, by the way, of Collie Park in uh, Portland. Portland is one of Portland, Oregon, one of our partner cities as well. This is a wonderful story of a park that instead of being designed by um, a parks department uh, and, and from kind of the top down, it was designed um, by the neighborhood itself. And so for example, those raised bed gardens uh, uh, on the left are, were designed by kids in, in the neighborhood. Anyway, it's a wonderful story. And if I forget to say this, um, on our webpage, we have a film set of films. We're frequently now making a short documentary films to tell these stories, five to seven minute films. And there is a film about Cully Park um, that um, it's a lovely film. Um, so uh, cities in our network are setting uh, uh, targets and trying to overcome these longstanding uh, inequities and systemic racism uh, that we see. Richmond, Virginia is in our network and, and a great example of this. They have now set minimum tree canopy targets for all neighborhoods. Uh, every every person in this neighborhood, every neighborhood should be within a 10 minute walk of a park. Um, and what's really impressive is the effort to uh, bring more nature, particularly into those underserved neighborhoods, those neighborhoods of color. So actually this fall, this is a, an image of um, a picture of LeVar Stoney, who's the current mayor of Richmond, and he's made this a priority. And in the fall, they unveiled five uh, new parks um, actually in underserved neighborhoods um, as a partial response to this, this social inequity. So um, we have cities doing wonderful things and I'm gonna start to transition to, to speaking a little bit more about birds, uh, but we have wonderful stories, uh, wonderful work and effort going on in our cities around North America and around uh, the world, and I don't have enough time to tell you very much about any of these places, but this slide is really meant to convey the fact that there's a lot of diversity and, uh, and, and, and diversity in, in terms of how uh, these cities define nature in terms of their targets, their aspirations, um, the opportunities to enhance and, and, and repair and restore nature and to rewild nature, but it is inspiring and to see the, the, the different things that these cities are, are uh, doing. And by the way, on the Biophilic Cities webpage, there is a page for each of the partner cities with a lot more detail and with lots of 
uh, links and uh, in some films uh, uh, as well. So, so there is this new book, The Bird Friendly City, which fits well into this frame, framework of a biophilic city. And there's obviously uh, a, a lot of overlap and, and complementarity uh, here. But I do want to talk a little bit more uh, about what some of the um, stories in the book are. And, and hopefully you'll have a chance to see, to see the book and, and, and read the, the book. I like to start just with the, the fact for me that birds are these, uh, a, a magical presence in, in cities. These are wonderful paintings by a local artist, Cynthia Burke. Um, these are two of our paintings that we own of hers. And um, you know, what, what they convey is for me uh, a sense that birds are um, the closest thing to angels we have around us. Um, and they are magical and, and, and the source of immense uh, beauty and joy and delight. And uh, any biophilic city has to think about birds and what we can do to uh, make room for birds and to create safe environments for birds. And for me, it's a quality of life issue uh, as well because um, I, every biophilic city aspire to be being a city where you hear a native bird song and so here's the uh, wood thrush eastern wood thrush which i look forward to hearing every spring uh, when i hear it it immediately takes me back to my childhood it is a uh it's hard to overstate the the importance of the animation the sounds the voices of um uh, as linda said our bird kin that we share our cities with. But I think this audience knows well the challenges we face, uh, the threats to birds. Um, this Cornell study from last fall was quite a shock to many of us that we had lost 30% uh, of our bird abundance um, you know, since 1970. Uh, lots of challenges, we, you know, climate change, habitat destruction, deforestation, uh, use of pesticides, um, uh, all the things that we know um, are the, it's not one thing, but many inter interlocking uh, causes of this uh, decline. And so um, a main argument of the book is that cities have to rise to the fore, they have to be part of the solution. And so what is a, a bird-friendly city? What are the things that it might encompass. And that's essentially what the book is about. And it is uh, telling the stories of organizations like FLAP. You're going to hear, I think, from Michael Mazur, uh, founder of FLAP, about the work there. But one of the first, if, if probably the first place where we see uh, in an organized way volunteers um, trying to understand the impact of, of of glass and buildings on birds uh, during my peak migration and, and following uh, uh, routes, uh, walking paths and looking for birds and collecting those dead birds, but also caring for uh, injured birds. Um, it's among other things, an, uh, an awareness raising step and they display um, the birds, the collected birds, the dead birds, um, usually at the uh, Ontario Muse Museum, I think, um, in very dramatic fashion. And, uh, and it's had a, a huge impact, I think, in terms of raising awareness about the, the problem um, and the need to design buildings and, and to use glass that can be uh, seen by, uh, by birds. So um, the, the trend, the positive trend is in the direction of more and more cities uh, like Toronto, Toronto was really the first North, North American city to, to have mandated um, bird-friendly glass, bird-friendly design. San Francisco, the first American city to do that, or U US city, um, described in some detail in the book. Uh, a lot of it, of course, has to do with um, use of fritted glass and bird-friendly glass um, that can be seen uh, by, by birds. Um, and a lot of stories and case studies in the book about, about buildings that have done this to great success. This is the story of the Jacob Javits Center 
Uh, they've replaced all the glass uh, with fritted glass, uh, bird-friendly glass, remarkable reduction in uh, bird mortality, but at the same time, by the way, uh, reduced energy consumption, lower carbon emissions. So we can do all of these things um, together. And also, by the way, uh, installation of a green roof uh, on the top, which has served as a nesting site for, uh, for birds. There's some of the fritted, fritted glass. So we have a number of positive examples of uh, buildings uh, like the Frick Environmental Center in Pittsburgh, a uh, wonderful um, living building certified building. Uh, in the book, I tell the story of this, um, this project, the side of the building that was retrofitted with paracords, parachute cords. It was a project um, with some uh, local high school students and uh, we didn't cost very much, but uh, lots of relatively low cost things that can be done to retrofit glass and building facades to make them visible to, to, to birds. Um, we can do a lot more with new buildings as well, of course. This is the, the new Candida building on the campus of Georgia Tech, which is another uh, certified living building. It is uh, net zero energy. So it's producing um, as much more energy actually than it needs over the course of a year. It's also net zero water, um, but it's also bird friendly and uses the, the again, fritted bird, bird friendly glass. And it's biophilic in other ways, bringing natural daylight into the building. Um, heavy use of wood, for example, which is a, very much a biophilic uh, building uh, material. Another example, and by the way, we have um, a, a great documentary film on our webpage about the Frick Environmental Center um, and also about this uh, new retrofit of an existing building, the Interface Carpet Company's new headquarters building known to them as the Base Camp which um, incorporates a really interesting biophilic, basically the image of a forest um, created through these uh, glass panels that are wrapped in this polyester sheath. Um, and it creates a very interesting effect uh, for people inside the building, but it also creates um, a facade that, that birds can, can see. And lots of other buildings, Described in the book, uh, Jeannie Gang's uh, design of the Aqua Tower in Chicago has become kind of a famous example of bird-friendly design, these undulating uh, terraces and also fritted glass uh, that birds can, can see. And uh, when you hear from Michael Mazur, he will likely tell you that bird-friendly uh, buildings will make for better architecture, or certainly more interesting architecture, and this is one building he may mention, the Ryerson Student Center, um, creating this, you know, wonderfully creative, beautiful, different uh, building facade, but yet also bird friendly. So what else can we do? In the book, a, a lot of other ideas. We need to protect the bird habitat that we have already in and around uh, cities, as well as uh, restoring and, and growing more habitat. This is a story from Australia that um, is a chapter in the book. It's a story of a highway that was going to knock down um, these ancient um, Banksia woodlands and wetlands. And uh, a hopeful story, um, the highway was stopped and the state government thrown out of office. And um, the image on the right is actually the, the ravine system in, in Toronto. But, um, we need to protect those really important habitats in and around uh, cities. Um, one of the interesting stories that we tell uh, from this Australian example is just how important that land was, that habitat to uh, the ab Aboriginal community. And in that part of Australia, Western Australia, it's the Noongar uh, people. And they have a totemic uh, culture where kids grow up um, uh, adopting a species as their totem. And, and so Noel Nanup uh, talks about this Noongar elder um, in an interview with us um, about his particular totem, which was a bronze winged pigeon. And you learn everything about that, that species, that bird, that animal, and then you become its advocate and you do everything you can to protect, preserve, uh, steward over that, that species. I think it's an idea whose time has come. So um, very quickly, there are so many other things that 
could define what a bird friendly city is. Um, as an urban planner, I'm disappointed that that most of our planning system doesn't take much account of birds or or animals and wildlife generally. Um, so these are images from from uh, a plan um, prepared by Edmonton. Edmonton Canada has a is now in our network, and they are using uh, this this mapping habitat mapping based around circuit theory, electrical circuit theory as a way of identifying, you know, what would it be like for a, in this case, uh, a, a chickadee, um, black cap chickadee to move through the city. What are the barriers <clears throat> like an electrical circuit um, and, and, and a, a guideline for us to create uh, connections, ecological connections and, and movement corridors for for birds in, in, uh, in cities. And it's coexistence, but it's also co-flourishing. We're flourishing, but birds are flourishing as, as well. And this is a city that has done a lot of planning around ecological connectivity. It's a wonderful story. They've um, now built their 27th wildlife passage, probably more than that now. So it's not bird, just birds, but it's movement of many forms of life through through the city. So we can bring more nature in, into our cities. We can repair the, the ecosystems, the remnant ecosystems that are there. Uh, Vittori Gastez, the capital of the Basque country, um, has just daylit a small river that was underground in a pipe. It's been brought back to the surface and brings water back to the city, um, which is very important for uh, uh, birds and also has created this wonderful new public space um, around this daylit uh, uh, river. So bringing water uh, back to cities is a big part of the planning challenge, I think. And this is a wonderful example from Western Australia, another Western Australian story um, about basically converting a very sterile water feature, downtown water feature, highly chlorinated, energy intensive, uh, not habitat at all for birds, to what is now a beautiful native biodiverse wetland in the mid middle of the city. We have a, a film about this, uh, about a five minute film, um, wonderful story um, and an interview with the, the landscape designer who designed and built this wonderful um, element feature in the city. So there is a chapter in the book about Singapore and the wonderful story of how they brought back the hornbills and the special nesting uh, program for building nesting boxes, smart nesting boxes. Um, but it's also a story of how the whole building industry really has been transformed and that uh, it seems just about everything that gets built in incorporates these, these uh, natural features and natural elements image on the left. These are actually two uh, projects of a design firm called Woha. Um, the middle one is a, a, a hotel called Oasia. And um, it replaces the, the nature lost at ground level uh, by something like 12, 1200%. I mean, it, and mostly in the form of this exterior, um, which is very bird friendly and incorporates um, multiple different species of flowering vines. So any time there's always something uh, flowering, um, whatever time of the year uh, it is uh, there. And uh, wonderful projects like uh, the KTPH, this is a hospital in Singapore, a biophilic hospital, uh, incorporating nature and lots of different elements. This wonderful green courtyard, uh, green rooftops, even a, a, an urban farm on the top of one of the main buildings. And for me, what's really interesting is they define the success of this building by the number of birds, uh, the, the number of species of birds and butterflies that have visited the site. And, and there's a running tally, uh, you see an image on the right here, uh, on one wall uh, of all the bird species that have been cited uh, here. What a wonderful way, a wonderful metric of success. So um, another example of, of how to think, rethink a city, Cura de Bat, which is a, a city in Costa Rica, also in our network. And there they have uh, undertaken a, a lot of um, pollinator uh, uh, gardens, uh, 
uh, particularly in parks and along sidewalks and in uh, creating these bio corridors for butterflies and birds, um, really important to think about the, the vegetation that you have in a city and the importance of uh, native vegetation, important certainly for, for birds. Um, it's a guardian story about uh, Kur Debat on the left, which um, talks about the, the mayor there uh, who believes that we need to be giving citizenship to bees, plants, and trees, and birds. So what uh, an interesting idea. We have some challenges though, um, rethinking the, the lawn uh, um, and uh, you know, thinking how do, we, how do we take that, those millions of acres of uh, single species biologically uh, a biological desert that is usually the case with our, with the lawns around our homes and turn them into bird friendly native gardens. Um, this is my colleague Nina Marie Lister, um, who teaches at Ryerson in Toronto, and she is a, a bit of a case study in the obstacles that we often face. So she installed um, this beautiful garden, native garden that you see on the left, um, and um, actually became the subject of an enforcement action on the part of the city. They have a, a weeds and tall grass uh, code. And uh, basically, you know, she was going to be fined uh, for this garden. Um, and it's ignited a, a whole debate, a whole discussion in the city of Toronto about uh, why, why, why you need an ordinance like that, this and, and how, how inconsistent it is with the biodiversity strategy and uh, other things that the city is doing to uh, protect and, and promote birds and, and biodiversity generally. So we've got to reform the codes that we have in many cities and we've got to do what we can to nudge along um, even in suburban and exurban locations where so much bird habitat could, could happen. Okay, very quickly, um, there are other threats and other things that, that cities could be doing to respond to those threats. We know about uh, domestic and feral cats and the huge impact they have on birds. In the book, uh, some discussion about things like the rainbow collar um, that homeowners, that cat owners could be using that help uh, birds better see and detect the, the presence of, of a cat and their cat bibs. There are lots of products out there and, uh, and they do work um, as well as campaigns to keep, keep cats in, indoors. Um, safe, safe, safe at home programs and so on. Uh, one of the really interesting ideas in the book and also another film that we've made is this, this notion of a catio or a cat patio. And um, these are images actually from an annual catio tour um, that is co-organized by Portland Audubon and the Feral Cats Coalition of Oregon. And it's usually 10 catios on display and you uh, move around and visit these different catios. Um, and so uh, what an interesting idea. Um, it is a way to give your cat some, some connection, some time outside, but also prevent them from killing uh, birds and, and other wildlife. So um, coming to the end, but there are so many ways that we can uh, begin to understand that birds are part of uh, what, we, what we want to see as a city of awe. We want to live in a biophilic city where, um, where we maximize the moments of awe. And that can take many forms. And it, if you're in New York, the return of whales, you know, the possibility that you might see a humpback whale or a dolphin. Um, but it's a, a, in many cities, the, the elements of awe have a lot to do with, with birds, it seems to me. And so we can foster that sense of awe by celebrating the birds around us. Um, sometimes there are really dramatic opportunities like um, nesting boxes swifts as they migrate through Portland, the, the story of, of the Chapman Elementary School and the chimney there, thousands uh, during, during the month of September uh, at the end of the evening, thousands of these Swiss kind of drop into the chimney to nest, to roost, um, and hundreds of residents come out every evening um, to watch that spectacle. And it's really 
a really a wonderful event. We had the chance to film this as well. And you can find this uh, a film about this, a five or seven minute film um, and see the, the, the Swifts in, in action. So um, we do think that we should be designing spaces in, in cities for birds and every building could accommodate birds. Um, this is a story from, the, from London. Uh, that's that's uh, a story in the book um, about uh, designing uh, roosting boxes and roosting sites into chimneys this, and into buildings, into homes. So this is the Waltham uh, Stow wetlands, of, uh, a really important bird watching site in London. And when they restored this tower of this engine house, um, they incorporated 54 um, roosting sites for, for common swifts. And the trend in the UK is in the direction of incorporating swift boxes uh, into the design and construction of new homes. So this is the story of Kingsbrook, um, one of the largest, maybe the largest wildlife friendly development in the UK. And it is the largest developer and uh, homeowner, home builder rather in the UK. And they've committed to making all their, their projects in the future uh, wildlife friendly. Um, we should be making birding the focus of every neighborhood. Um, Aldea is a, a community um, near Santa Fe. Um, where they've uh, been installing um, nest boxes for this endangered uh, juniper titmouse and been very actively engaged in um, a feeder watch uh, or nest box uh, watch uh, initiative. Um, there's a chapter in the book about uh, efforts to, um, to bring back burrowing owls actually to, to, to um, install artificial nesting sites for, for displaced burrowing owls, uh, wonderful story. Uh, um, it, it's, these are actually images from a film, another film that we made about this. And we uh, spent a day um, with volunteers who were actually working on these artificial um, um, nesting sites, underground nesting sites. And it's uh, um, really a fascinating story again um, enhancing the quality of life of a city like Phoenix, uh, showing that it's possible to, to have uh, burrowing owls um, and also development and also um, residents nearby. Oh, here's a little pitch for um, the film. I am getting close to the end. I think there's so many other creative places where we could be incorporating birds, uh, particularly in schools. Um, these are images from Atlanta Audubon um, and they've had an initiative where they visit schools and they um, you know spend time with the kids try to uh, get get them uh, interested in, in birding and and, and uh, understanding the biology of birds but just also just the fun uh, of it and um, and I think given the mental health challenges we're facing right now in the pandemic, uh, schools would be, bird, birds and connected to schools would be a wonderful idea. We need, we need to do, be doing more of this. I do believe that we need to be judging the progress of cities in different ways. And you know, what, what would be a better metric for a city than um, birdsong? And uh, so this is a story of, from Wellington, New Zealand and also told in the book uh, a wonderful effort to build a predator-proof nature preserve in the middle of the city that serves as a point of propagation for bringing back native birds, and it's worked. And uh, and their tagline is bringing birdsong back to Wellington. So returning to uh, the wonder and curiosity is these are really important elements. And this, by the way, is I think this is my last image um, from a a, a bird walk, an annual bird walk that we have organized here on the campus, on the grounds of UVA, University of Virginia. And um, these are mostly students, not, not usual bird watchers or birders, but I think uh, part of our challenge is to help um, everyone recognize that a city, this is a campus, um, but that 
um, birds are found everywhere and that we should begin to see a campus. We should begin to see cities as uh, places where we're going to see birds. We want to see birds and co-share, co um, coexist and, and share those spaces with, with uh, birds. It might take some, some nudging, uh, some, some raising of awareness, some challenging um, in this case, challenging my students to, to look for birds, something they'd never done before. So I'm coming to the end, um, and uh, here is the book, and Island Press uh, is making available this discount if you um, are able to use this code, and uh, maybe we can make that available on, uh, on the festival website um, as well, or put it somewhere else for people to have. Um, and there are other resources, other books about biophilic cities that we've written, other films. Um, the latest book, which is also an Island Press book, is the Handbook of Biophilic City Planning and Design, which has just recently been translated into Chinese. And, um, and that's it. So please take a look at our, our network. And uh, if you are in a city you think might be interested in joining the network, we'd love to to uh, hear from you. Um, and all the films that I mentioned are also on this webpage as well. So thank you very much. And I'll stop here. That was a wonderful presentation. What a great body of work. What incredible ideas that you bring to the table. Uh, you've got great accomplishments. And it's just um, wonderful to have such a, I'm going to use the word again, great example of leadership. I mean, mm. you have a profound love of and understanding about things like birds and mm. biodiversity and cities and humanity. And we're mm. so lucky to have you here to talk about what your work is and how it could impact our work, because we have a lot of work to do here. Yeah, these we ideas, do. <laughs> these ideas that you're bringing here with the Biophilia Network and, and just who you are is so important. Mm. And we're going to work hard to try to create a, a a resilient area, um, right. an area that has cities in nature. Uh, we live in nature and we're going to do that. And, and with your help and with other people's help, all of you out yeah. there watching. And I want to let you all know uh, that we do have uh, Tim's book, The uh, Bird Friendly City, in our silent auction, which you can find on our website. We will have the discount code up there on our website so you can buy it at a discount. And um, it's just, you know, thanks. I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm just blown away by this presentation. It's wonderful. I do have Thank a question. You. Sure. So when you talk about uh, rewatering cities and opening up creeks yeah. and, and small rivers, we have that issue everywhere. And certainly yeah. in, in where I live. And the problem is a lot of this, these waterways have been traditionally used for 100 years or more as sewers. Yeah. And so opening it up to the sky right. and, and rewatering is something we all want to do. But yeah. We have such horrible sewer, sewer issues. Right. I, even in Buffalo, the Buffalo Sewer Authority, their main treatment plant is on the Niagara River. Now, oh, that's already yeah. open. You know, we'd like to see it get off there. But we have Skijakuta Creek and other creeks that just drain sewers. How do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good, good question. And um, I think there are other things we need to be doing too, right? So um, the example of, of uh, Vittoria Gestez, that, that was, um, you know, that was cleaner water being back, brought back to the surface. It wasn't, it wasn't a contaminated uh, site. But anywhere that you have, um, you know, a developed area where, where, where the hydrology has essentially been engineered and put underground, uh, you, you have those opportunities. But yeah, absolutely, um, we need to be cleaning up as well. Um, you, you mentioned the canal, made me think of the Gowanus Canal in, you know, in Brooklyn or in New York. Um, we have a lot of places that uh, um, are pretty foul and need to be you know, yeah, restored and for ourselves and also for birds and wildlife um, that depend on that, on that water. Um, it could be new, or there are a lot of new ideas for how we, we treat um, uh, sewage and, and maybe we can shift away from those large sewage treatment plants. Um, some of these living, uh, certified living building um, buildings have, have um, centralized composting toilet systems 
Um, there's certainly lots of examples of so-called living machines, use of constructed wetlands as a way of treating uh, sewage, um, and and sort of you know creatively finding ways to reduce the loads anyway, and and uh, and certainly. Um, moderating you know, using bioswales and rain gardens and all the all the things we know how to do that would address the stormwater runoff kind, kinds of issues. Um, so many things that we could be doing that would clean better clean water could also bring more nature into our cities. And rain gardens and bioswales are a good maybe a good example of that. Rather than sending that that water you know down a, a storm storm pipe that ends up contributing to a you know it's a combined usually a combined sewer overflow problem right it, it, it uh, you end up getting raw sewage you know dis discharges um anything we can do green roofs uh, again you know tree planting all, all those things we, we used to um talk about those things uh as as um you know, sort of not very uh, mainstream, but they really are quite mainstream now, right? So all these kind of biophilic design elements that have a, the ability to retain water um, could help, I think, on that, on that mission. I want to remind people <laughs> that we have- That was a long group. answer, sorry about no, that. That was a great answer and, and it addresses a lot of the issues we have here for sure. But I want to remind people, we have this as in, a, in our silent auction. And they are, some of the ones we have are signed by Tim. In fact, Tim, you've, you've donated these to us. So go to our website, go into the silent auction, the proceeds benefit Birds of Niagara. You can also get, purchase them separately if you don't win the auction uh, through the discount code. And um, so thanks. And Linda, I don't know, you might wanna uh, jump in with a question or two too. I think we've got maybe another five minutes we can do here tonight. But two, two thoughts occurred to me. One is, um, that Buffalo is a great city to think about this because we are um, a low density city, but we are a walkable city because we were designed uh, before the automobile was here. And so, you know, yeah. our, our lots are 25 by 100, you know, it's like it's a very, very different kind of thing. Um, and most of the examples that you showed um, were, um, you know, public lands or, 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 or new projects. We don't build a lot of new buildings in Buffalo. We have a yeah. huge infrastructure of old buildings and I appreciated the, the towers. I thought that that was really good. Um, but do you have examples of cities where um, communities of people, you know, private owners and stuff um, actually worked together to create um, habitat amongst by blocks or whatever in that, in that way? Yeah. Um... I have to think about that. Uh, I'm not sure I have perfect examples. I mean, we have a lot of uh, cities in, in our network that have uh, that have taken advantage of, of the um, opportunities of being maybe shrink, a shrinking city in the sense of having vacant, vacant land. I mean, we tend to think about uh, places like Detroit, for instance, but it's More like Buffalo. You know, a lot of cities. Yeah, that it, it, even if you d don't really think of yourself as a shrinking city and um, Almost every city, Philadelphia, for example, has lots of vacant lots, and um, there are examples, you know, of really creative efforts to to um, combine lots and to you know convert those lots into small pocket parks um, and to plant bird friendly things and and um, in some cases orchards to address food insecurity. Uh, certainly, is the case in Philly, but. But uh, Milwaukee is another example, a city in our network that has this homegrown initiative, basically taking, you know, creating parks where they're needed. I mentioned the, the challenge of social equity and underserved neighborhoods. And, and uh, so there are a lot of those kind of opportunities. And, and, and the best examples are, are ones where this doesn't just happen because of a, of a, of a parks department or somebody doing it from outside the neighborhood. It's, it's something you know, it's a project uh, taken on um, by the neighborhood or by residents around that park. And then they become, you know, in, uh, um, in, invested in that and become the caretakers of that, those places. So, 
So there are a lot of those kind of rewilding examples. Um, I, I like that what I remember about Buffalo is you had all those historic buildings, right? You have a lot of wonderful um, built, built environment from, you know, right. from your past, your history. Sure do. Yeah. And I don't know whether there are opportunities now to, to renovate or rehabilitate uh, structures um, and you know I have lots of examples of older buildings that have uh, now have green roofs for example or have you know biophilic elements that would be good for birds mm -hmm. for instance that interface carpet interface base camp for example I think it was a 1970s building and uh, and that's now a small green roof on the top and it's it's you know profoundly different building and from a carbon footprint point of view you know that makes a lot of sense right we it's, it's great if we have the chance to design a new building and it can be a living building certified living building and has all the things we'd like to have it, it to have but on the other hand the best strategy from a carbon point of view or, or a, you know sustainability point of view is to save that existing building and all the embodied energy if we can, all the body energy, embodied carbon that that building uh, contains, um, and uh, so maybe I, I, you know, maybe you have opportunities like that. that would be wonderful to explore. Thank you, Professor Beatley. And I just want to remind everyone that we're more than just Buffalo. The Niagara River corridor stretches from <laughs> an urban area in Lake Erie yeah. to an urban urban areas in Lake Ontario. We have a number of urban areas in between on Grand Island, Niagara Falls, and both sides of the border. We're connected to the Great Lakes, to Toronto, and to the Great Lakes, to places like Cleveland and Chicago and Detroit. Right. We have a lot of connections. I want to right. remind everyone that you can see other presentations on Birds of the Niagara by going to our website. We have a lot of great presentations. Go check them out. Check out Professor Beatley's books. And uh, let's, let's move forward and, and make future generations proud of what we can do today. <laughs>